I'm Erwin Shemrinsky. I'm dean of the law school here, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the conference. The idea for this conference started with an email that I received from the chancellor, Howard Gilman, over a year ago. He said he thought it would be important to hold a major conference on race and policing. I did what any dean should do. I turned to somebody else on my faculty and said, would you please plan the conference? Um, I immediately turned to Song Richardson. I did so in part because Song has done terrific scholarship in this area. I also do it because I knew that Song would do a great job of planning the conference. She then... <laughs> she then turned to colleagues across campus to work with her, Carol Saran, Cheryl Maxson, Jeff Ward, and they've done just a wonderful job in every way of planning this conference. Put on a conference like this takes a great deal of logistical support, so I want to thank those who have done all of the hard work to make today successful. I want to thank Cassandra Flores from the law school, Fred Lipscomb, Fook Nguyen, and David Benton, who have all done the hard work to let us be here today. Um, as the program says, the conference is so co-sponsored by the law school, the School of Social Ecology, the Chancellor's Office, the Provost's Office, the Office of Student Affairs, and New Narratives. In an early planning meeting, there was discussion about who would be the ideal keynote speaker for the event. And the first name to be suggested was just Shira Shinlin. Her name was suggested and was immediately, this was met with great enthusiasm. The only concern was, could we possibly get her to make the trip from New York to Los Angeles? Now, I thought that if we would do the conference in January or February, we might have a better chance. Um, but I was thrilled when Judge Shinlin agreed to come to be our keynote speaker. Let me just do a short description of her credentials. The, I could spend all of her time just telling you her many accomplishments. She's a graduate of the University of Michigan, a master's in history from Columbia University, a graduate of Cornell Law School. She then clerked for a federal judge, was an assistant United States attorney. She was a general counsel in an important city department. She was special master in a couple of mass torts cases. She worked in private practice. And then in 1994, President Bill Clinton nominated her to be a federal district court judge in the Southern District of New York. And she served in that capacity until just this spring. There are so many things that she did as a district court judge that are truly noteworthy. Um, what she did in the area of electronic discovery truly changed the federal rules in this area and practices in federal courts all over the country. And I still want to hold you to your offer to have you come teach a course here in electronic discovery. <laughs> but what especially brings her to us today is her courageous work in Floyd versus City of New York, which dealt with the issue of police staffs by the New York Police Department. She wrote lengthy opinions. She stood up to public opinion. She stood up to the bureaucracy. And she showed us what truly a courageous judge can do. So this is a wonderful chance to introduce you to one of my heroes, Judge Shira Shinlin. Well, thank you, Dean Chemerinsky. It is an honor for me to be introduced by you, because I've admired you so much for so many years. And this is a special moment. But it's also a late moment in the day. I'm very aware of that. Some of us have been at this 11 hours. We were picked up at 7 a.m. this morning at the hotel. It is 11 hours later. So uh, that's the way it is. It's a keynote. It's a formal address. I apologize in advance. There's nothing I can do about it. Whoever heard of putting a keynote at the end of the day, but so be it. But the good, <laughs> but the good thing about having a keynote at the end of the day is that almost everything I'm going to say, you've already heard today. All I can do is weave it together. You'll be amazed how, how much I say has been touched on in one panel or another. And this is a chance to put it all together. And hopefully, you'll let me do that. But again, because it's a keynote, it's formal. It's written out. Unlike all those wonderful speakers who just spoke, no, this is a formal address. So here, here we go. I'll do the best I can to not speak as fast as a couple of speakers, but to speak a little faster than I might otherwise. So I want to begin with a, a very condensed historical overview, which I believe sets the context for the relationship 
between the police and the African American community. I'll then move to the Floyd case, and then I'll conclude with a look at where we are three years after Floyd. So the story, of course, as you've heard today, begins with slavery, the way that African Americans were brought to the country, bought and sold as property, forced to labor without pay, and truly, uh, cruelly treated uh, by their owners and masters. They couldn't look to the law to protect them. Indeed, the law was employed to ensure that they and their descendants remained slaves. In an article that recently appeared in The New Yorker, uh, Jeff Tubin described the work of Brian Stevenson. I hope you all know who Brian Stevenson is. He defends death penalty cases in Alabama through the Equal Justice Initiative, a great organization that he founded. But one of Stevenson's comments particularly resonated with me. And this is what Stevenson said when he was interviewed by Tubin. Quote, these recent police shootings are symptoms of a larger disease. Our society applies a presumption of dangerousness and guilt to young black men. And that's what leads to wrongful arrests and wrongful convictions and wrongful death sentences, not just wrongful shootings. There's no question that we have a long history of seeing people through this lens of racial difference. It's a direct line from slavery to the treatment of black suspects today. And we need to acknowledge the shamefulness of that history. That's a quote from Brian Stevenson. Terrific quote. In another recent article, this time in the New York Review of Books, Daryl Pinckney, an African-American novelist, essayist, and playwright, gave his view of the role of police first with respect to controlling slaves in the South, and later poor black workers in the North. He wrote about the slave patrols, which again you have heard of all day, who stopped, harassed, whipped, injured, or killed black slaves in order to monitor and suppress slave rebellions. At about the same time, however, in the North, Irish immigrants became police officers and often found themselves used to maintain the status quo, that is to control a labor force of non-white people who were feared by the recent immigrants. Well, after the Civil War and after the rise and fall of Reconstruction, debt peonage emerged as a new form of slavery in the southern states. And by the way, this topic was brilliantly cataloged in a book I recommend, Slavery by Another Name, by Douglas Blackman. I'm going to give other book recommendations. I can't resist that. Anyway, African Americans were often arrested for non-existent offenses, like speaking rudely to a white woman, walking in a certain way, or yes, literally spitting on a sidewalk, or for petty offenses like gambling, disturbing the peace, making noise, or vagrancy, which by the way, you can translate as unemployment. After the arrest, the defendants would usually plead guilty to avoid an inevitably unjust trial and a very harsh prison term. But once they pled guilty, they were sentenced by local judges to fines that they could not pay. Businessmen, that is plantation owners, coal mine owners, factory owners, paid the defendants fines and then forced the defendants to sign a contract to repay the debt by the way, a contract that he couldn't read and he couldn't sign with his name, he just put an X. And then the defendant was forced to labor for months or years, treated as a slave, underfed, chained, chased by dogs if he tried to escape, beaten and often killed. Thousands of, Amer of African Americans served in debt peonage from 1880 through World War II and law enforcement played a leading role in maintaining this tragic system from the arrest by the sheriff through the sentencing by the judge. The whole system was complicit. Once again, I must jump ever so briefly from history to the present. This notion of excessive fines resulting from trivial offenses turned up in the DOJ report that we heard about earlier of the disparate impact of such tactics on the black citizens of Ferguson. The report concluded that some offenses were almost exclusively charged against African Americans. 
From 2011 to 2013, African Americans accounted for 95% of manner of walking in roadway charges, 95%, and 94% of failure to comply charges. In fact, Ferguson's Municipal Court operates as part of the police department. The court is part of the department. The purpose of that court is clearly to maximize revenue. In total, the municipal court system raised more than $52 million for St. Louis, counties, St. Louis municipalities in 2014. African Americans bear the brunt of this model of policing. 96% of the 256 people jailed on an outstanding warrant between April and September 2014 were African Americans, 96%. Of the 28 people who were held for more than two days, of the 28 people, 27 were African Americans. Not surprisingly, this led to terrible police community relations in Ferguson. Well, no speech on this topic would be complete without mentioning what is known as extrajudicial punishment. Again, a recent report by Brian Stevenson revealed that between 1877 and 1950, there were 3,959 lynching victims across 12 southern states. Stevenson reports that these lynchings were not about administering popular justice, which is what we thought, but they were about terrorizing a community. Many lynchings were not punishments for any crime, but rather imposed for perceived violations of the racial hierarchy, offenses like bumping against a white woman or wearing an army uniform. In short, the lynchings were a message to other African Americans. Rather than protecting the victims, law enforcement often joined in this lawless conduct. Now, in the New Yorker article I mentioned just a few minutes ago, Stevenson observed as follows, and I quote him again, wonderful guy, so here it is, another quote. He says, lynchings were moved indoors in the form of executions. They guaranteed swift, sure, certain death after the trial rather than before the trial. Lynchings to executions. In another great new book titled Lynching, a new book called Lynching, and it was, it was, the full name is Lynching, the epic courtroom battle with, that brought down the Klan, an author named Lawrence Lemer describes how the Southern Poverty Law Center sued the Klan and bankrupted the Klan with a huge judgment for instigating and encouraging the 1981 lynching of Michael Donald, the last recorded lynching in Alabama. Now that's a civil suit that they got the idea to bring the Southern Poverty Law Center. Now, three more quick historical notes. The first is the war on drugs. You've heard it, heard it again today, but you don't know maybe the history. It began with the passage of the Harrison Act that criminalized the possession, use, and sale of narcotics in 1914. Yes, this war has been going on now for 102 years. And as everybody said, it's a failure. But from the very beginning, this war was focused on minorities. This is a historical fact. The first head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics was a guy named Harry Anslinger. And he took office in 1930. Somebody here knows Anslinger. He believed that Mexican immigrants and African Americans were using marijuana more than white people. And this is what he said. The most frightening effect of marijuana was on blacks. It made them forget the appropriate racial barriers and it unleashed their lust for white women." <laughs> End quote. End quote. Now, according to Johan Hari, Another great book called Chasing the Scream. I really recommend Chasing the Scream if you haven't rec read that one. Anyway, Hari uh, wrote a devastating expose of the failure of the war on drugs. And he said, quote, the main reason given for banning drugs, the reason obsessing the men who launched that war was that the blacks, Mexican, and Chinese were using these chemicals, forgetting their place and menacing white people. Close quote. Now, the press embraced this theme. It was claimed at the time that cocaine turned blacks into superhumans who could take bullets to the heart without even flinching. This was the official reason why police across the South 
increase the caliber of the, of the bullets used in their guns. The second historical note is the decades of sentencing policies that have resulted in the over-incarceration of African Americans. You are all undoubtedly familiar with the steep rise in the prison population. We heard a talk today about mass incarceration, and it's also known as the carceral state. Maybe you'll read the new book out on the Attic Uprising. Terrific new book. If anybody has uh, seen it yet, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of that one, so I can't yet tell you how terrific it is. But anyway, uh, as you know, this steep rise in, in the prison population was based on the mandatory minimum sentencing re regime which emerged 40 years ago as part of that war on drugs. And again, I, I apologize, you heard this. Although the US makes, makes up only 5% of the world's population, it now incarcerates 25% of the world's prison population. The US incarcerates a higher percentage of its population than any other country in the world. Guess who's in second and third place? Rwanda and Russia, we are really in good company. African Americans make up close to 40% of the prison population, 20% are Hispanics. The same disparities are found in state prisons where minorities are equally disproportionately represented. Much of this, at least at the federal level, was due to the disparity in sentencing for the possession or sale of crack as opposed to powder cocaine, a disparity which has finally been, been reduced but not yet totally eliminated. In addition to the prison population, and I want you to think about this statistic because it hasn't been mentioned today, another five million, five million Americans are subject to parole or probation supervision at any one time. And by the way, most of them can't vote, just an aside. And again, I have a book recommendation, Incarceration Nations, if you haven't heard that one, by Baz Dreisinger terrific book. She describes and contrasts prison systems around the world, and she convincingly demonstrates why our prisons are among the worst in the world, something, again, that we are not proud of. The third historical note is wrongful convictions. The short version is that many wrongful convictions were obtained as a result of corrupt or sloppy police work, including providing false testimony, hiding exculpatory evidence, planting evidence, obtaining false confessions, or simply not investigating alibis or other suspects. A great example of this was chronicled in a book by Nate Blakesley called Tulia, Race, Cocaine, and Corruption in a Small Texas Town. Some of you will know this book. Almost 20% of the black residents of Tulia were convicted of narcotics offenses and sentenced to lengthy prison terms based on the false testimony of an undercover officer. All of them, all of them were eventually exonerated, but only after spending years in prison. A, a discouraging uh, story for sure. And somebody asked a question, I just have to di divert from my script for a minute about qualified immunity. I think it was Professor Fagan who asked about that. Look, I was gonna give you the answer. The answer turns on the election of a president who will name Supreme Court justices who will change the qualified immunity jurisprudence. Nothing went worse than the last couple qualified immunity cases when our dear departed Justice Scalia was on the court. With the, with the hope of a new majority, you will see a change in qualified immunity law, I believe. Okay, turning now to Floyd. I, I, do, I do promise to get there and I'm here. The finding of racial bias in New York's stop and frisk policy which is set forth in the Floyd liability opinion, was built on four forms of proof. One, the uncontested statistical evidence. The record was what it was. There was no fight about that. The testimony of the experts, one of whom was uh, Professor Fagan, who analyzed more than 4.4 million stops to determine whether there was racial bias. Third, the institutional evidence of deliberate indifference on the part of the department including the unconscious racial biases or indirect racial profiling exhibited by police officers. And fourth and finally, the examples of individual stops by selected plaintiffs who were members of the Floyd class, 
but that's the one, only one of the four I can't begin to describe the individual stories. But if you have time, go read the 196-page opinion, and if you do, you can get those stories. Okay, the uncontested facts, some of which I can recount, provide the backbone of the finding of a pattern of disparate racial impact of New York's stop and frisk policy. So I'll give you just some of those stats even though you probably know them that now. So of the 4.4 million stops that were analyzed, 52% were black people, 31% Hispanic people, 10% white people. But at that same time, the population was only 23% black, so it was double. 29% Hispanic, almost the same, but 33% white while the stops were 10% white. The numbers of stops rose uh, uh, sharply, we know, uh, to the high of 686,000 in 2011. You've heard that already. 52% of all stops were followed by protective frisk for weapons. A weapon was found in only 1.5% of these frisks. Now, I use the word weapon, not gun. If you go just for the guns, it's far less than 1%. So it didn't do, frankly, much, if anything, for getting guns off the street despite what the Republican presidential candidate said during the debate. As usual, he was just wrong. Anyway, <laughs> in any event, no further uh, law enforcement action was taken in, as you heard all day, in 88% of the stops, basically 88% 80, of these people whose day and life was interrupted were completely innocent. Nonetheless, force was used in 23% of the stops of blacks, 24% of the stops of Hispanics, but only 17% of the stops of white. This is a good one. Between 2004 and 2009, the percentage of stops where the officer failed to state a specific suspected crime, the officer couldn't even tell us what crime it was stopped for, rose from 1% to 36%. So for a third of these stops, no crime. Uh, for the period 2004 through 2009, when any law enforcement action was taken following a stop, any law enforcement action, blacks were 30% more likely to be arrested as opposed to receiving a summons than whites for the same suspected crime. For the period, and this is the last one, for the period 2004 through 2009, all else being equal, the odds of a stop resulting in any further enforcement action were 8% lower if the person stopped was black than if the person stopped was white. So together, these results show that blacks were likely stopped based on less objectively founded suspicion than whites. In other words, the stops of whites were better stops. There was more basis for it. Okay, the next form of proof was the expert testimony where the following question was addressed. Quote, what would the racial distribution of the stopped pedestrians have been if the officer's stop decision had been racially unbiased? The plaintiff's expert, who's in front row, use both population and reported crime as ben benchmarks for understanding the racial distribution of police citizen contact contacts. But by contrast, the defendants experts used a benchmark consisting of the rates at which various races appear in suspect descriptions from crime victims. So his assumption was that if the stop decisions had no racial bias, then the racial distributions of those stopped would approximate the racial distribution of criminal suspects in the area. But I found that the defense experts benchmark was flawed because there was no basis to assume that the racial distribution of the stop group should resemble the racial distribution of the local criminal population because the stop population were not criminals. Since as we've said, 90% of them, there wasn't even a breadth of a law enforcement action to follow. So because objectively there shouldn't have been uh, any behavioral difference between law-abiding minorities and law-abiding whites, the remaining explanation is that law-abiding minorities appear to be more suspicious than whites because that is the racial makeup of the criminal population. The only explanation for the very close correlation between the racial composition of crime suspect data, which was 87% minority, and the racial composition of the stop population, which was 83% minority, is that people were stopped because they resembled the criminal population. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is racial profiling. 
The third form of proof was the institutional evidence of conduct by the police department. A very quick summary is that police department policy created pressure to continually increase the number of stops on the theory that this functioned as a crime prevention tool. This pressure translated to the precinct level in terms of productivity quotas. More stops led to more pay, more promotions, fewer stops were viewed as shirking. This caused precinct commanders to encourage officers to stop, and I quote, the right people at the right time in the right place, which led to racially biased policing. Other institutional failures included ignoring the notice of the statistics, which I just gave you, that demonstrated to anybody that there was racially biased policing, a failure to discipline officers engaged in racially biased policing, and a failure to review training materials to ensure that they were race neutral. Finally, the evidence revealed a failure of oversight, of oversight over how stops were conducted and how they were recorded. The documentation of stops on these forms called UF-250s was often sloppy. It was rarely reviewed by supervisors. And the patterns that we see from the recorded stops, such as furtive movements or high crime areas, were accepted over and over again as a basis for a stop. So I want to give you just a couple examples. The first is the perception of what is a furtive movement, which was so often used as the basis for a stop. Two officers in the Floyd trial testified to their understanding of the word furtive movement. One said, well, furtive movement is a very broad concept, and it can include a person walking in a certain way, acting a little suspicious, being very fidgety, going in and out of a, a location, looking back and forth constantly, adjusting their hip or their belt, moving in and out of a car too quickly, turning a part of their body away from you, grabbing at a pop pocket or something at the waist, getting a little nervous, maybe shaking, and my favorite, stuttering. Another officer explained that usually a furtive movement is someone, quote, quote, hanging out in front of a building, sitting on the benches or something like that, and then making a quick movement, going inside the lobby, and then quickly coming back out, and all of a sudden becoming very nervous, very aware. Well, from that we can see that if officers believed that that behavior justifies a stop, then it's no surprise that these stops rarely produced any evidence of any criminal activity. As Judge Richard Posner stated in a related context, this is just a great quote of his, whether you stand still or move, drive above, below, or at the speed limit, you will be described by the police as acting suspiciously should they wish to stop you. Such subjective, promiscuous appeals to an ineffable intuition should not be credited. End of, end of Posner quote. Another example from the trial record were the surreptitious recordings of police talk within the precinct. There were, there were people who were secretly recording. Uh, they were police officers, naturally. Anyway, these quotes demonstrate the contempt and hostility of supervisors toward the local population. For example, at a roll call at a precinct in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, which is an overwhelmingly black neighborhood, a lieutenant said, quote, we've got to keep the corner clear because if you get too big of a crowd there, you know, they're going to think they own the block. But we own the block. They don't own the block, all right? They might live there, but we own the block, all right? We own the streets here. You tell them what to do. Close quote. At another roll call, the same lieutenant stated that the officers are not working in midtown Manhattan, where people are walking around smiling and happy. You're walking in Bedford-Stuyvesant, where everyone's probably got a warrant. Now, it is amazing how this quote presaged the Supreme Court's recent opinion in Utah versus Strife, where the court held this summer, this June, that if a person was stopped without reasonable suspicion, but turned out to have an open warrant, then any fruits of that unconstitutional stop would not be suppressed. As pointed out by Justice Sotomayor in a very passionate, and I dare say personal dissent, she noted that approximately 7.8 million people in the United States have an open warrant, mostly for minor offenses, such as traffic violations or unpaid fines. 
in Ferguson again to return there for a minute, 16,000 of the 21,000 residents have open warrants. And St. Louis officers routinely stop people solely to check whether they may have an open warrant. Justice Sotomayor noted that over a four-year period in Newark, New Jersey, officers stopped 52,000 pedestrians and ran warrant checks on 40,000 of them. A Justice Department analysis revealed that 93% of the Newark stops were not supported by reasonable suspicion. But now it won't matter. Permission given. That's the case. One more digression. I recently saw an op-ed by a former Baltimore police officer. He's now retired from the Baltimore Police Department. And the name of his article was, When Police Are Poor Role Models. He told of an incident where a sergeant saw a group of young black men on the street, and he told an officer to order the men to leave. The officer said, well, he had no reason to do that. And the sergeant said, make something up. On another occasion, when the office, officer, this retired uh, officer from Baltimore, told a detective that he had made a bad search, the detective said, quote, we don't care about what happens in court. We just care about getting the arrest. The officer then ended his article with the following words, quote, with the right leadership and training, and if the good officers stay, the department can uproot the attitudes and practices that have poisoned its relationship with the black people of Baltimore and begin an era where the police will be role models for the city and one another. Okay, returning to Floyd. With respect to identifying who to stop, Chief Esposito, who was the highest ranking uniform member of the NYPD, who had the courage to come and testify at trial, unlike Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Esposito said, and I quote, stops are based on the totality of, okay, who is committing the, who is getting shot in a cer certain area? Well, who is doing these shootings? Well, it's young men of color in their late teens and early 20s. A deputy inspector gave a virtually identi identical answer testifying that, quote, this is about stopping the right people, the right place, the right location. The problem was what? Male blacks. And I have no problem telling you this. Male blacks, 14 to 20, 14 to 21, close quote. In fact, then Police Commissioner Ray Kelly allegedly said, since he didn't testify and get cross-examined, but he allegedly said at a meeting, at which the Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams was present, he allegedly said that the NYPD focused on stopping young blacks and Hispanics, quote, because we wanted to instill fear in them. Every time they leave their home, they could be stopped by the police, and that's what he allegedly said. And this evidence led me to conclude that blacks had been targeted for stops in order to deter crime regardless of whether they appeared to be objectively suspicious. This is a, we heard earlier, sort of, you're thinking about it, maybe. Okay, that's the theory. Well, Floyd was really two decisions. The first of the two I just discussed, that was the liability opinion. But the second opinion imposed the remedies, we called it the remedies opinion, that were needed to correct problems that were identified in the liabilities decision. So the first remedy was to the appointment of a monitor and a facilitator. The monitor's role is to work with the police department in implementing the reforms that I set out that needed to be done in the, in the opinion. The facilitator's role is to meet with community groups to identify reforms that were not required in the remedial order, uh, but they may be, maybe they should have been. So the idea is to talk to the people and see what's needed. The monitor has already issued two lengthy reports detailing his progress in implementing the reforms. And so uh, a brief summary of the, of the reports demonstrates how a court's order, you know, because all day you heard professors and experts, I'm neither, I'm just, was, was just a trial judge. But you do what you can, and here's how a court's order translates into real change on the ground. So the first and most important task was to revise the patrol guide which provides written instructions to officers as to how to conduct themselves in their work. The monitor, together with the NYPD, revised the guide to provide clear instructions on the constitutional standard for making a pedestrian stop, and the patrol guide now tries to set out whatever it is we do know from Terry versus Ohio, which has been uh, criticized uh, a lot today, so I won't go over that. 
Improved training materials were prepared also to educate new recruits and to provide refresher training for officers and supervisors. More importantly, new forms have now been developed to document every stop. And these forms are better than the old forms. They're, you're now required to really explain what the suspicion was, not just check a box. And some boxes, by the way, have been eliminated. And supervisors are now required to review the forms to determine whether the stop was constitutional based on what's provided in the forms. Data collection is going to be automated and centralized so that stop patterns can be analyzed and evaluated. So the new form, which I understand is actually only being used on a pilot basis, eliminates high crime area, eliminates furtive movement, and eliminates suspicious bulge. It now requires, as I said, a narrative and uh, a tear-off receipt is given to the person stopped, which tells that person the name, command, and badge number of the officer who made the stop, and it also provides links to the NYPD website, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, and the Internal Affairs Bureau. It also does tell the person why they were stopped. Well, follow-up studies, since it's just experimental, follow-up studies have shown that there was a 20% reduction in reported stops in the commands that are using the new forms. Now, does this mean that the officers don't want to be bothered with the forms, so they're making less stops? I don't know, but there is a 20% reduction. But a review of the forms by the Quality Assurance Division also revealed that 28% of those forms, even now, did not properly articulate reasonable suspicion for the stop, 27% did not document reasonable suspicion for a frisk, and 16% failed to demonstrate any basis for a search. So obviously further training is still needed. There have also been new policies against racial profiling that have been instituted. Officers are instructed that no police action can be motivated even in part by the actual or perceived color, ethnicity, or national origin of an individual. Race may be used only if it is part of a reliable and specific suspect description that includes not just race, gender, and age, but other identifying characteristics. So for example, young black male is no longer acceptable. The New York City Administrative Code now prohibits bias-based profiling. Uh, so the other area is, of course, implicit racial bias. And you've heard about that. How does one train on that? The department has retained professors to do that. And they're here. And they're serving as consultants. A July 12, 2016 article in the New York Times discussed the difficulties in reducing or eliminating unconscious racial bias. The article noted that studies show that police officers have the same biases toward minorities that the general population has. In truth, folks, look inside yourself. We all have them. In one study called the Implicit Association Test, participants were asked to make rapid-fire association between images of blacks, whites, or other races and threatening words or images. The results were not surprising. Blacks were more often and more quickly paired with threats. The results were the same regardless of the race of the person doing the associate, associating or their alleged view of race. Other reforms include improving auditing of stops and frisks, better system for imposing discipline, um, both internally and externally, and an early warning system. And finally, the remedial order did call for a test program with body cameras, uh, but that's been slow to happen and was recently criticized in the New York Times for three years later, and we still don't have uh, body cameras. So my final topic is a quick look uh, at the post-Floyd world. In New York, as you know, stops are way down, 97% down. Yeah, we, were we were down to, I think, 22,000 in 2015. And what has happened with crime when we had this huge 97% drop in stops? Well, they've actually decreased for some crimes, and they've remained steady in others. In short, despite the dire predictions on the front page of the Times from Commissioner Kelly, crime did not blow up. The city didn't burn. Indeed, just two months ago, the New York Daily News, one of New York's most famous tab tabloids, published an editorial titled, We Were Wrong. Ending stop and frisk did not end stopping crime. The editorial concluded, quote, post stop and frisk, the facts are clear. New York is safer, while friction between the NYPD and the city's minority communities has eased. Well, that's the good news. 
But the bad news is that in the three years since Floyd, there continue to be shootings of unarmed black men by police, which has stirred a national debate, which we're having here in this last day, about race and policing. Tragically, we've also seen violence against police officers in New York, Dallas, and New Orleans, seemingly as payback for police shootings. When I last gave a talk like this, I went through the names of victims. I won't do that today. But what are the patterns that have emerged? Well, all of the stops that resulted in fatal shootings were for minor offenses. You've heard that throughout the day, which raises the issue of the broken windows theory of policing. Second, many appear to be the result of fear, fear on the officer's part, who overreacted and who stereotyped. Third, in several of the incidents, most tragically, the police gave a completely false account of the event as established beyond doubt by simultaneous video recordings. Finally, it may be that there's a lack of clear guidance on when an officer may use either lethal or non-lethal force. Uh, I'm going to skip now like everybody else did because time is really up and we hope to have a little time for questions. I did have a section here that explains the standard for use of force, uh, but I will have to skip that. Hopefully you know about uh, the standards set forth in Tennessee versus Gardner and Graham versus O'Connor. But the point is we don't have a national uniform standard, and we should. Uh, so according to the executive director of Amnesty International, the international standard for the use of legal lethal force states that, quote, lethal force should be used only as a last resort in the face of imminent death or serious injury. Now that could be a standard nationally acceptable. Apparently it is <laughs> in other countries, but not yet here. Um, we have some studies about the use of force by police, and that did not come up yet today, so I won't skip that part very quickly. The Center for Policing Equity, a New York think tank, collected data from police departments across the country. The data show that the police were 3.6 times as likely to use force against blacks than whites, three and a half times as likely. Another study by Harvard economics professor Roland Fryer found that blacks and Hispanics are more than 50% more likely than whites to be subject to non-lethal force by police. That is things like being handcuffed, pushed to the ground, or hit with pepper spray. Pepper spray, although he didn't find racial differences in police shootings. However, his study of police shootings was based on a very small sample, only 1,332 shootings from three states over a 15-year period. But his study of the use of non-lethal force was based on the 5 million stops in New York. Which brings me, of course, to the final topic, and that is the willingness of the police to fabricate a defense and the ubiquitous video recordings that have revealed the scope of this problem and the distrust it has caused. The most vivid example, which again did come up today, is the shooting of Laquan McDonald. McDonald, a black teenager, was shot 16 times, mostly while he was lying on the ground. Police officers at the scene claimed that McDonald was lunging at the officers with the knife in his hand. But in the video, which was recorded on October 20th, 2014, but not released for 13 months, it showed no such thing. In fact, it clearly showed McDonald moving away from the police when he was shot. Lawyers from the family and the community groups eventually petitioned the court to appoint a special prosecutor, saying that the state's attorney's office was too close to the police department to effectively handle an investigation. Uh, likewise, in other cases, the videos have shown uh, that what was said by the police was not the case. Well, where does all this leave us? We need to follow the lead, immodestly, of the Floyd decision and the monitor's work in implementing the reforms and working with the community and what our Attorney General has now called constitutional policing. If we can conquer the fear and mistrust that has grown between the police and the communities they police by eliminating racial stereotyping, by addressing the imbalance in the racial makeup of the police force, by moving away from the police acting as paramilitary forces and towards a community-oriented approach, by increasing the use of body cameras and more sophisticated training, then maybe we will all live in a safer world. I thank you for your patience at this hour, and I'm happy if there are any questions if I can answer them. Thank you.
you want to go to, you want to go to the mic? Sure. Oh, they're not there anymore. So just, just come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. There. And then it's general articulable fact, this new language of articulable concern is emerging as well. So in essence, uh, speculative and hunch-based policing is getting increasingly legitimate. The challenge we have is, and I won't take more time, the challenge we have is that when we file the public records, then they claim, now this is something on the basis where people are engaging in constitutionally protected activity, like taking photographs in public or using video cameras, but these files are being open. And even when they find that there is no nexus to terrorism or criminal activity, we ask them through public records to release that they claim investigatory exemptions. So it's kind of like creating this, 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 this catch-22 where we, we can't get access to that. If we don't get access, then there's no case law. But yet at the same time, all these files are being open and these new standards are emerging around reasonable indication or of concern. I just wanted to hear your thoughts as to what we as, as organizers and people can do. Uh, I think what you're really talking about is data collection. A lot of information is being collected about us. and We don't know what that data is. We don't know who has access to it. We don't know what's being done with it. But from the perspective of a judge who had cases and enforced the law, there wasn't, there's no legal act to take action about. There's not an arrest. There's not a charge. There's not an indictment. There's data collection. Our privacy is at stake. That's what's really going on in today's world. The surveillance is perfectly legal. They collect this data. They, you know, can can use cameras and, and phones and audio equipment. And the data is stored somewhere and it's used somewhere. And who knows what what they're going to do with it? That that's the future. We don't know what's going to be done with it. But what's to do now? Probably nothing from the perspective of the law. The law has nothing other than the FOIA exemptions that you mentioned. That's a problem because when you do try to get at right. the information. They say the investigatory privilege, and, 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 and they prevail on that. They always prevail on that. So it's really a matter of our privacy, which is another topic. Our privacy is very much uh, at risk right now, I think, in this country. We don't have much privacy protection. Any, any other questions? I can understand if there are none. It's late in the day. Oh, good. At least there's one more. Your Honor, I, I just had a question about the uh, stop and frisk suit in New York sure. and the way it was tried in front of you. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if the lawyers for the city, uh, were they just blatant about we're doing this and this is the right way to do it? Or were they trying to make, uh, give reasonable explanations for the stops or suggest that they weren't motivated by race? I'm just wondering what, what, what kind of position did they take? Yes, it, it's a good question. Look, these were, these were young line attorneys. Yeah. They were being directed by the mayor, the mayor, the police commissioner, and the corporation council. I referred to them once as three angry white men. I mean, there was, I mean we, had, we had Bloomberg, Kelly, and Cardozo. That's who set the strategy. These young attorneys were doing their job. They did it with vigor and with passion. But after it was over, I'm sure none of them believed in the city's position. Some of them, by the way, some of them are now still in the case Working, working together uh, with the plaintiffs to work on the remedies. They're happier now than they've ever been. They look better. I mean, I mean they, they really look, they look miserable during the trial. Right. They, they, were, they were doing what lawyers do. And, and lawyers, as you know, defend uh, guilty people. We, we have a job to do. That's what right. lawyers do. So I think the young lawyers were doing their job as well as they could. Did they believe in it? I doubt it. As I said, I've seen these people. They're mm -hmm. almost, they almost apologized to me. <laughs> but but the, in, the interesting question in the Floyd case was why it wasn't a jury trial. That was the fascinating question. It was supposed to be a jury trial. But the plaintiffs, I think, got the bright idea that they didn't want a jury. They wanted the trial judge. Mm -hmm. And so they dropped their claim for damages right. so that exactly. it was solely an equitable mm -hmm. case. And I, I argue with them. I beg them not to do that. <laughs> because I said, I can see what's coming. 
no matter what the verdict is, the judge will be attacked. It will be said that she was biased, right. she wasn't fair. You know, basically, I'm going to catch hell for this. <laughs> however, however, it comes out, and a jury of our peers, if you you know, if you do right. seat eight or twelve of them, the the it will have more legitimacy. But I couldn't convince the plaintiffs, and there was no way to force a jury. I tried that too. I said to the defendants, "Isn't there something you can do to, you know, make sure this is a jury?" They couldn't come up with any Once idea. Once it's an equity case, I yeah, think yeah, they it's couldn't. I know case. they couldn't. So, I yeah, know, right. but I knew. I saw the future. I saw the future. I saw the future on that. And you predicted it right. I did. I did. Well, they started during the trial. The yeah. attack on the judges started. Judge started during the trial. There were some very scurrilous things that came out that had no truth at all during the trial. But that's okay. Intimidation uh, has never been a problem for me. Anyway. <laughs> so I have a, yeah. I want to follow up on the question I asked yeah. from the floor before. Um, so Section 58 in the New York State Constitution um, allows, basically shields any kind of personnel record from public visibility. And there are variations on this in various states around the country. Um, and I suspect that some transparency about who the police are and what their past records have been would help us think a little bit more clearly about regulation, politics notwithstanding. Um, I'm wondering, you know, as I asked about an avenue towards uh, uh, poking into qualified immunity, yeah, yeah. What, 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 is, what would be, I guess it's a political question more than anything else, how do you get through 50A? How do you sort of un overturn that? This, seems, this would seem to be a, a, something ripe for political action by communities well, are, that are, have distrust. I don't know, are you suggesting that there should be no protection to the personnel records of the police officer? So how would you overturn it? How would you rewrite it? But if they've appeared in prior lawsuits, that can be built up and that's built up in lawsuits. Yeah. Well, we look at that, though. No, no, we look at that. In every case of an individual against an officer, the plaintiff's lawyer always requests the records. They're usually given to the judge for in-camera review, and the judges routinely will, will turn over those portions that would show, yes, that would show substantiated prior complaints. So every case, those records are produced to the court. But those are protected. Sorry? Not necessarily. No. Not necessarily once they're, I mean, I guess more often than not, but not always. You're right. It's not, it's not something you can analyze as data. That's the problem. You can't get access to thousands of them at once and take a look at that. But in individual cases, I will say they are, they are produced, and that often leads to a settlement. When they find out how bad the particular cop is, then the case settles. We have one final question. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. And, um, one of the things I wanted to just point to was the fact that you talked about you at the maybe the first 60 percent of the <laughs> presentation you were talking about books that you yeah, read about yeah. the political history yeah. of the relationship between slavery and slave patrols yeah. and policing. Yeah. And I just wanted to say thank you for oh. being a reader. Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of times those of us who are experts in social sciences at the universities don't necessarily read that kind of political history. Um, and actually kind of steep ourselves in it so that the kind of concepts that we ask uh -huh. are less hidebound and uh, related to the things that have been published for the past 10 or 15 years because we have a much bigger corpus of research to pull from if we right. would look at the political history. There so just thank you for the okay. citations. Thank you for being a reader. I'm sure it had a really big impact on your ability to make the argument. And you know, for all my colleagues, let's all keep doing that. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Willoughby Harard. Oh, you have one up there. Well, this has been an extraordinary day and an extraordinarily long day. I thank many, all of you who hung in were here with us and those who didn't. And I know that it was difficult for the judge to be the last speaker, um, but I think that there's one takeaway message from this, and that is, is that despite all the structural dimensions that we've seen, courage and an individual can make an enormous difference. And that's what this judge showed us in the position that she took and the way she decided the case. And as if those of us who remember following the case, she was victimized in the press as she made this decision. It wasn't pretty. Um, and so we all owe her an enormous debt of gratitude for setting a standard and helping us carve chip away at this enormous problem and challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.